I'd say one of the things that's been, um, you know, really uh, encouraging to me is seeing all the work that people in our extended community uh, have been doing uh, during the past couple of years in order to bring about positive public health outcomes. Um, and so this session is going to include a couple of uh, really nice examples of work in digital experimentation um, uh, related to the COVID pandemic. And so um, uh, first up, we have Heng Cheng Dai, um, faculty at uh, UCLA, who's going to um, uh, uh, talk, talk about some of our work on nudging vaccine uptake. Heng Cheng. Hello, everyone. I'm Heng Cheng Dai from UCLA Anderson. I'm excited to talk about uh, the impact and limits of nudging vaccine uptake. And as many of you know, mobilizing people to get vaccinated has been a public health challenge both before and during the current pandemic. And earlier this year, my collaborators and I conducted uh, two sequential randomized controlled trials to understand how various strategies can affect COVID-19 vaccine uptake. And today I'm going to share with you some lessons we learned from those trials, which we believe have broad implications for how to use behavioral science to address vaccine uptake and other behavior change challenges. So in those two trials, we tested the effectiveness of behaviorally informed reminders, as well as some message framing and information provision interventions that are added on top of those reminders. And we collaborated with a large healthcare system, UCLA Health. As a general timeline, eligible patients were invited in batches to get the COVID-19 vaccine at UCLA Health at time T. And then on the next workday, T plus one, patients who had not yet obtained the vaccine anywhere uh, or scheduled appointment at UCLA Health were enrolled in our first RCT. And eight days later, uh, patients who still had not taken any action were enrolled in the second RCT. Those RCTs were carried out from early February to mid-April this year. And a couple of months ago, we published the results about uh, patients who were enrolled earlier in February um, that provides some lessons about the promise of leveraging nudges and behavioral interventions to promote COVID-19 vaccine. And today I'm going to share results with you based on all patients who have been enrolled during the full trials. And I will first tell you about the reminders, how we designed the reminders, as well as the lessons we gleaned about the reminder intervention. In the first RCT, patients were randomly assigned to the holdout arm or the reminder arm. In the holdout arm, they did not receive any text reminder. And those in the reminder arm actually, um, sorry, there is typo, it should be first reminder, uh, not first slash second. So people in the uh, RCT one, in the reminder arm, they received the first reminder at 3 p.m. on the first reminder day. And there are additional manipulations that we introduced later, okay? That I will, I will, I will talk, sorry. To clarify, there are additional interventions on top of the reminder, and then I'm going to introduce those additional interventions to you later. For now, I'm going to focus on the fact that people in the reminder arm received a reminder. And across all the subarms within the reminders, the text message always shared two elements in common. First is all the reminders made COVID-19 vaccination top of mind in order to tackle forgetfulness. And also they included a direct link to the appointment scheduling website at UCLA Health. So people can easily take actions and make appointments right away. And this was intended to reduce inconvenience and procrastination as potential sources of friction. Our most basic text read as Dean, you can get the COVID-19 vaccine at UCLA Health, make a vaccination appointment here. In the second RCT, patients were again, okay, if they had not taken any action by the time of the second RCT, they were enrolled and they were again randomly assigned to either the holdout arm without getting a reminder or the reminder arm where they got the second reminder at 3 p.m. on the second reminder day. And similar to the first reminder, the second text reminder was intended to increase the salience of COVID-19 vaccination and make it easy for people to act by including a direct scheduling link. Okay, 
So first, let's talk about how do our reminders affect vaccination? To evaluate this basic effect, I will begin with one primary outcome measure that tracks whether patients receive the vaccine at UCA Health, our collaborating organization, within four weeks of the first or the second reminder date. Okay. So here I'm control. I'm, I'm comparing the reminder arm with the holdout arm. In the first RCT, the first reminder on average increased the vaccination rates at UCLA Health by uh, 2.8 percentage points within the four week observation period. And this is an increase relative to a 10.6% in the whole hour. Receiving the second reminder increased uh, vaccination rates at UCLA Health within four weeks by 0.8 percentage points from a baseline of 4.6% in the whole hour. Beyond vaccinations at UCLA Health, we also pre-registered to examine other variables. For example, we pre-registered to understand whether patients also scheduled a vaccination appointment within six days at UCLA Health, which is more proximal DV, okay? And also we obtained the data from uh, California Immunization Registry. With that data, we can assess whether patients got the vaccine anywhere in California. So we looked at within four weeks and within eight weeks. Here, I'm gonna show you the percentage point increase in each of those four outcome variables as a result of either receiving the first reminder or receiving the second reminder relative to the holdout arm. Okay, so the effect of the first reminder is larger for appointment within six days, which is more proximal to the intervention, to the reminder, and it attracts an easier action compared to the outcome measure of vaccination at UCLA Health in four weeks. As we expand the scope of our outcome, our outcome variable to include vaccines that people could obtain outside of UCLA Health, the effect size reduces to a statistically significant uh, one percentage point. So on one hand, it's encouraging because a single tax reminder still has some positive impact on overall vaccinations four weeks later, despite that people were presumably receiving all kinds of communications from various sources. On the other hand, it's worth noting that the effect size reduces as we shift from a narrow behavior within our collaborating organization to a broader and a more comprehensive outcome measure. As we further extend the time window from four weeks to eight weeks, uh, the effect size further decreases. We basically see the same pattern with the second reminder whereby the effect size depends on whether we study a more or less immediate outcome, a local or a more comprehensive um, outcome measure. Okay, so the first question we address is on average how effective the reminders are and how does the efficacy varies across uh, different outcome variables. Then the next question is for whom our reminders work better? And for this section, I'm gonna focus on UCLA Health vaccinations as the outcome measure, and I'm happy to talk about other measures during the discussion section. And to recap, um, our behaviorally informed reminders are designed to reduce follow-through barriers. They are designed to tackle forgetfulness, reduce inconvenience, and address procrastination. So we expect them to work better among people who already have some intention in place and just need some nudge to actually close the intention and action gap compared to people who are resistant to the vaccine in the first place. To test this prediction, we did several analysis. The first thing we did was to leverage some unique features in our setting. During our two months of experiment, people become eligible in California for the vaccine at a different points in time. That's one feature. And the second feature is people were invited by UCLA Health to get vaccine there in batches rather than being invited all at the same time as they become eligible in California. So for those two reasons, there were some um, variations in vaccine hesitancy or baseline motivation for people to get the vaccine over time across the batches of patients who are invited at different points in time. And also because people were randomized into conditions within each batch, this allows us to use overall vaccinations in the holdout arm among each batch of patients as a proxy for those patients' general and baseline motivation to get vaccinated. And we can test whether the overall vaccination rates of the holdout arm 
in a batch correlate with the size of the reminder effect that we observe for that batch of patients. And I'm, I'm going to show you such a correlation based on scatter plots first. In those two figures, each dot represents one batch of patients, and the dot size represents the number of patients in each batch. The x-axis represents overall vaccination rate in the holdout arm among a given batch of patients, and then the y-axis represents the difference in vaccination rates at a UCV health between the reminder arm and the holdout arm among a batch of patients, okay? And for now, I'm plotting raw data for you. So it, it's basically the reminder effect based on raw data. And then we see generally a positive trend such that the higher the overall vaccination rates in the holdout arm was, the higher uh, was the effect of receiving either the first or the second reminder on vaccinations at UCLA Health. But we, of course, should more formally test it. Um, so if we put everything to a regression framework, uh, we will see that the holdouts group's overall vaccination rates in a batch significantly interact with the offering of a reminder intervention in terms of predicting the outcome measure of getting vaccinated at UCLA Health. So this provides some suggestive evidence that um, text reminders can produce a larger effect on vaccinations among people with a higher baseline willingness to get vaccinated as proxied by the holdout groups or overall vaccination rate. And in additional pre-registered analysis, we examined another two proxies for, pa for patients' baseline motivation to get vaccinated. And recent surveys suggest that people who got the flu shot in recent years and people who lean towards the Democratic Party have higher COVID-19 vaccination intentions. Therefore, we examine two moderators. One, whether a patient obtained the flu vaccine in one of the two recent seasons. And the second one is whether a patient's county voted in favor of the Democratic or the Republican presidential candidate in 2020. And the second variable presumably indicates the extent to which the patients themselves lean Democratic versus Republican. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the results uh, breakdown. So it's basically the effects of receiving either the first or the second reminder uh, broken down by patients' flu shot history and their county level voting outcome. Both the first and the second reminders had a larger effect among patients who recently obtained the flu vaccine than those who did not, okay? And the reminder effects were also larger among patients whose county voted in favor of Joe Biden last year than those whose county uh, voted in favor of Donald Trump last year. And we also confirmed that uh, the interactions between each moderator and the reminder treatment is significant. Um, in, in case you are curious, um, when we look at uh, the percentage of voters in a given county who voted for Biden, rather than looking at this binary, uh, voting in favor of Biden versus Trump, the results are robust. So those two moderators um, as proxies for people's baseline motivation to get vaccinated further suggest that uh, the reminders that are designed to close the intention action gap seem to work better among people who already have some intention in the first place to get a vaccine uh, compared to those people who might be more hesitant to begin with. Okay, so I will briefly talk about the additional interventions we added on top of text reminders and share the lessons with you. In the first RCT, we nested a two by two design within the reminder arm. First, we manipulated whether people were invited to watch a two minute video via the text message. The video was designed to correct people's misconceptions about COVID-19 vaccine. And then we're hoping that by correcting their misbeliefs and misconceptions, we can increase their vaccination intentions. And second, uh, inspired by recent work suggesting that psychological ownership um, can change behavior, we constructed language to induce feelings of psychological ownership towards the vaccine. Specifically, we manipulated whether the text message indicated that the vaccine had just been made available to you and encouraged the patients to claim your dose, okay? So that's about the first RCT, video as an educational tool, providing information, and then ownership framing. 
In the second RCT, uh, we nested a two by three design within the reminder arm. We manipulated the two factors. Uh, the first factor has two levels. So either we highlighted the personal benefits or the pro-social benefits of getting the vaccine. And earlier this year, a PNS paper um, published by um, Ashworth et al. suggested that highlighting personal benefits can increase vaccination intentions than highlighting the benefits for others. And their study was done in a survey experiment. So here, let's see how it turns out in the field. For the second factor, we had three levels. We either had no framing, just a basic message, or we highlighted the early access patients had to the vaccine during our trials, or we framed getting the vaccine as an opportunity for a fresh start. Okay, so in the first RCT, um, the four bars correspond to the four subarms since we have a two by two design. Okay, so all subarms outperform the holdout arm, which is indicated in this graph by the red horizontal line. But more importantly, relative to the basic reminders, adding the ownership language. Okay, the two white bars, adding the ownership language boosted vaccinations at UC Health by an additional 1.0 percentage point. Uh, but inviting people to watch a video in this case did not produce any detect detectable effect. In the second RCT, we do not see any meaningful differences between the subarms. Those six bars are not really it is meaningfully different from each other. The only statistically significant difference we observe is that uh, the exclusivity framing increased the vaccinations by a tad relative to the basic reminder, uh, but this effect does not survive multiple hypothesis testing. And we did not find a difference between the self versus uh, pro-social framing. We also find no significant effect of the fresh start framing in this case. And to inform policies, um, of course, it's great to do RCTs. Um, we're lucky that we had the opportunity to test it in a randomized control trial, but researchers often have to rely on surveys of intentions to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions. So we find it's interesting to understand whether hypothetical responses to interventions will match behavior in the field. And so in the final part of my talk, I will explore this question using the framing and the video intervention deployed in our first RCT. Earlier this year, in February and April, we run two pre-registered online experiments among US adults who had not yet received the COVID-19 vaccine at that time. Participants imagined getting a text reminder from their healthcare provider, and they were assigned to see one of the four reminders from our first RCT. Okay, to recap, we manipulated the ownership framing versus basic reminder with a video, without video. People in the video condition also watched the video. And then everyone indicated their vaccination intentions on a one to seven scale, one to seven point scale. Okay, so in the field, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you results from our field experiment as a comparison. So in the field, we see while the video intervention did not bring any benefits, the ownership language increased vaccination rates at UCLA Health. Interestingly, our online experiments show uh, different patterns. So we see that um, actually the people in the video condition reported a greater vaccination intentions than people in the no video condition, but the ownership uh, manipulation basically did nothing relative to the basic reminder. So had we used those online experiments to inform our decision about what intervention to roll out at UCLA Health, we would have betted on the wrong one. So what have we learned all together? Well, first I showed you reminders could increase vaccinations up to four weeks, um, but the effects really vary with the scope and duration of outcome measures. And this highlights the importance of considering substitution and acceleration when policymakers and the behavioral scientists evaluate and not just impact. Second, we find that reminders are more effective when recipients have a higher baseline vaccination intentions, and we do this using several proxies for baseline vaccination intentions. So the negative news or news that uh, would encourage us to think more is, well, maybe we do need more forceful interventions um, to help overcome uh, vaccine hesitancy, right? Because those are people who have low baseline motivation. They cannot be easily moved by behaviorally involved reminders or other subtle interventions that target at the intention action gap. 
That said, the silver lining is um, there are inflection points. Um, so reminders may be useful, may become useful for promoting, for example, booster shots or children's vaccine uptake. So there are opportunities that reminders will be more effective. And the third lesson is uh, enhancing psychological ownership can further increases um, can further increase vaccinations, um, but other framing interventions at least when we combine them with the second reminder, apply them to a more hesitant population. In our second RCT, uh, we observe no detectable detectable benefits. And inviting people to watch a video, right? People have to opt in. Inviting them to watch a video does not seem to help in our case. And the final part of my talk suggests that hypothetical responses need to be taken with caution when deciding what interventions to roll out. And even better, I think it's going to be an important future direction to understand how can we make hypothetical responses in survey experiments more predictive of people's behavior in the real world. And we are very happy to see similar reminders being used by public health agents and pharmacies to promote vaccinations recently. And they may have gotten inspirations from prior behavioral change research or recent vaccination studies by other research teams, or maybe a little bit inspiration from our own work as well. Okay, with that, I want to thank my awesome collaborators, particularly Silver Sakato from CMU, who is currently on the panelist and will join me later for discussion, and Daniel Kroymans from UCLA House, as well as other collaborators and research assistants. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot. That, that was great. Uh, I mean, this is super impressive work, and it's, it's great to see this additional um, update to some of the data that we you know, know from the pages of Nature. Um, so very cool. And I think you did a great job of, of really contextualizing the nuance of some of this. One of the things that I thought was, was interesting here was uh, the outcome uh, on just UCLA health versus the broader vaccination. And I think it's so great that you had that data because we could really worry about substitution, people choosing to get their vaccine at UCLA because they know it's going to be easy, right? Um, uh, I wonder about cases where we wouldn't have that other data and whether how often would we be misled in choosing good interventions by this narrower outcome data? Not unlike what you were saying about the hypothetical uh, uh, you know, lab experiment based interventions that could have led us astray here. Um, I, what's, what's your sense quantitative or intuitive about um, how, how good of a guide those kinds of more narrow outcome measures could be? Yeah, exactly. Silver and I are fascinated by this observation. We're glad that you echo this excitement. So we are actually currently have working on this exactly question um, by looking into uh, prior research that has done meta-analysis on behavioral nudges and trying to get some sense, call their outcome variables, trying to understand to what extent um, actually people are focusing on the narrow outcome variable versus the broader outcome variable and how actually the effect size may differ. And um, it's still still working progress and I don't want to spoil the results yet, but we definitely, I definitely think that's important direction to address and we're working on that. So maybe invite me or Sylvia next year to code so we can share the results. Cool, thanks a lot. So we'll, we'll definitely get back to some of this because um, of how related uh, these two talks are. But um, uh, next up, uh, we're gonna hear from uh, Jake Bowers at University of Illinois, Jake. So uh, thanks a lot for, com for, for, for having us. This is really an amazingly uh, propitious uh, set, of, set of talks because this is a conversation that, that we are, are having uh, um, and the, more, than, more than the two labs should be having. And, and it's also a great example of how fast we can move as a society when we need to solve a problem. Um, and and uh, so, you know, in, the, in less than a year, we've had two large field experiments, and I'm going to talk about one of them. I'm Jake Bowers. I'm the presenter. Um, this is the nicer title slide. I teach at the University of Illinois and have some other affiliations you can see here. Uh, this is the title slide that we really should have shown, which is, uh, which, is, which is very busy, but it shows that it takes a whole team in order to make uh, these kind of projects work. This is, a, this is work which couldn't have happened without the, the Rhode Island Department of Health and all a lot of amazing collaborators. So we begin with this question, our team at the Policy Lab at Brown um, has been collaborating with the, with the Rhode Island Department of Health. And uh, the big question that we faced 
was how to reach people who had not yet been vaccinated. Last May, um, uh, the RIDO, uh, which is the Rhode Island Department of Health, uh, had identified about 160,000 people who had not yet been vaccinated, but who had been tested. So that's how they, they, they populated a database. They knew that they'd been tested sometime since the beginning of the COVID crisis, um, but they had not yet been vaccinated. And the question is, how do we help them, spur them to be vaccinated? So in a series of meetings with members of our teams, our team, we thought, well, why, why don't we try something quick? and easy, which would be text messages, simple message reminders. We had, we had read Professor Dye's paper uh, in, uh, and we had read a, a variety of other papers and we thought if it works for seasonal flu, it might work here. We also realized that you know, some of the flu studies showed interesting declining effects and no effects, but we thought it was worth a try, especially since no studies reported reduced vaccine uptake due to, due to message reminders, okay? So we, we, um, we our, our study was a study that, that the, the idea was to find which uh, of many messages would be most effective in prompting people to accelerating people's you know, movement toward vaccination. We actually, as a baseline, gave everybody the ownership prompt from the previous literature. Again, it's just to reiterate, often it takes years for, for studies to, to accumulate like this. And we were so lucky to have the previous literature that we could find and uh, you know, immediately apply uh, to, and, and try out. Another benefit of digital experimentation is that it wasn't that costly. We didn't have to you know, uh, set up entire new field teams in order to do this. Um, so we can talk about the, the, uh, the messages later. One, one, one interesting feature of this was that you know, our, our, our team uh, you know, scoured the literature, um, and, but then also had a lot of meetings with the people in Rido to decide what, what they felt would fly from their previous experience with the people of Rhode Island. And we even had preliminary discussions with people who did ethnographic interviews with different populations in, it, in Rhode Island. We, uh, so we began with about 160,000 uh, uh, adults um, and we decided to, and we, and we, and we designed an SMS message um, uh, 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 campaign uh, that looks familiar to you probably this, after, the, after the last talk. It begins with, it's a message from the Rhode Island Department of Health. And then, uh, you know, it ends with uh, a vaccine is available for you and varies a different kind of messaging. And, it's, and, and our population is this database uh, that, that, that it was, was many people uh, proportionate to the population of Rhode, Rhode Island, but it's certainly not a sample. We, after these early discussions about the need for different populations to react differently to different messages and the need to vaccinate people and not just learn about how vaccine, you know, which message works better, we decided to create an adaptive uh, experimental design. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that in the next slide. Um, because of, of limitations on sending of text messages and that we could only send them in batches, uh, we first randomly assigned people to a week and then to a day and then to a condition. Um, um, we have a little asterisk here because the study ended one day early. So it doesn't hurt the uh, results of our study. We have, they had already been randomized to, to the last day, but SMS messages were not sent on that last day, which is why our total N was about 140,000. So the, the cool thing about the adaptive experiment, many, maybe many people on this call are already know, know it, um, but from the perspective of public policy, it's pretty great because it can help us in theory, vaccinate more people by identifying the messages that, that, are the, that are most effective and allocating sample to those or the people from the experimental pool uh, into, those, into those arms. What we did was a version of that where in the, in the first week, we randomly assigned everybody to one of eight messages or control. And then in the next week, um, we increased the probability of assignment to arms where more people had been vaccinated. However, we also reserved 25% of the pool in that week for a fixed, ran fixed probability randomization. The idea here is that if we made a bad bet in the first in the first arm, we would be protected against that. And also, we also want to learn. So we're trying, we have two goals here, learn about which message is most effective to do that equal probabilities is more or less the right thing to do, but we also want to vaccinate more people. And so we're trying to balance those two goals um, uh, with, this, with this procedure. Uh, right, okay. 
Um, here, here are our results. Um, the, the results are, are basically tiny differences. Um, one thing that I, I tend to do when I look at plots like this is I look at the x-axis and you'll notice that these are differences of proportions which are, are very, very tiny. Um, you can see just for fun that I, I put the ends uh, for each arm and you notice that we, we allocated a lot of sample to the family concern arm um, uh, uh, over, over time, but it didn't, you know, it didn't, it wasn't actually the winner uh, across all, uh, all, all, of our, all of our arms uh, in, in, that, in, in the end. Um, the, the left panel shows the difference in proportion of people be between the uh, no message condition and any of the other uh, sub message conditions, uh, whether they were vaccinated at all during the study period, um, which was a little unfair to people who got the messages in the la toward the end of the study period because they only had a week or so to get mass get, get vaccinated. The right hand side is vaccination within one week. Um, and you know it, we see no no real no real effect uh, whether you were vaccinated within a week or with or 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 at all in this particular case. Um, as you can see, I made I made this presentation fairly fairly short, but that's I, I think we can have more fun with more conversation. Um, so the question is, what is how do we interpret this? Uh, this these these no effects. We went into this basically imagining we're going to find an effect and then we're going to run with it. Um, uh, so, so here are our post hoc interpretations that you can help us with. Perhaps um, we suspect that maybe you know the efficacy declines uh, from the at the from the moment of policy roll, rollout. That the previous studies, uh, uh, you know, the the one that we read from 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 the UCLA team at the time of designing all of this was that it, they they had sent out messages immediately at went right to people who were waiting to be vaccinated or at the beginning of flu season etc uh to to overcome kind of forgetting we do we did see we have an example of a field experiment uh, run by folks at the oes the chen et al study uh which had declining effects of a postcard actually um uh, to veterans uh, uh over to over time why do we have this effect? Well, we don't really know. It could be that there's a novelty effect early on, that a novelty of, you know, addresses forgetfulness very early. Maybe we have annoyance later. People get, are, 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 you know, have already received messages from other actors. Maybe there are floor effects. Maybe there are certain people who are susceptible to messages and others who are not susceptible to messages. A message isn't gonna give you time off of your job. A message is not gonna change your deeply held belief. Uh, or other kinds of motivation or fears about getting stuck with a needle. So maybe what happens is that immediately anybody who's susceptible will react and then the people who aren't gonna, cannot be moved by a message won't react. And so therefore we see declining effects over time, but we don't know exactly uh, the, re the answers to all of these things. Our conclusions are that uh, SMS messages didn't hurt, but didn't help. And maybe it was too late. Uh, in the vaccine and the when the rollout will roll out what are the policy consequences we probably shouldn't depend on text messaging for adults who haven't been vaccinated so so cvs uh, although it's super cool that they're paying attention to us cvs should probably save its money unless it knows who it's vaccinated. unless they have just infinite money and they don't care they're going to get very tiny effects uh, for people who haven't been vaccinated yes However, maybe we should all run out of this panel and start sending SMS messages about child vaccinations, like right now, because now is the time, if we're right, if our, if our post hoc interpretation is right, based on the DIE study and our study, maybe we should be sending messages today about child vaccination so that we can, uh, and maybe we should try to target families who've been vaccinated. Uh, and so that we can kind of like accelerate the process of vaccinations among those susceptible to these really cheap, you know, these small, cheap little little messages can, can be can be really effective in kind of moving people through the vaccination pipeline that and then we can turn our policy attention toward the really hard cases, maybe. The other thing that I, I want to point out is that we were able to, to do all this really quickly. Um, in part because of the sharing of, the, of our greater scholarly community um, and also from the openness of our policy partners. Our policy partners wanted to learn broadly. They're interested in all of the literature coming out, but they also want to vaccinate locally. And the adaptive experimentation approach really helped us 
make, you know, convince them that yes, our, we want to help vaccinate. We understand that we're not out to learn at the, at the, with that, with costs to make a cost of vaccination with this, with this team. So I'll stop there and I appreciate, uh, I uh, can't wait to have all, have all the discussion. Cool. Um, yeah, very interesting. Thanks for, thanks for sharing, sharing this impressive work and, and some of your, uh, kind of in interpretations of, of what's going on. Yeah. So in, in a second, we'll take a question from, from Ronnie. Um, but first I had a question, um, about, uh, how to think about this, this sample or this population that you were working with, because this was people who had gotten a COVID test, but, um, uh, but hadn't yet been vaccinated. And I'm just wondering about that population and, and whether that was people who maybe had actually eventually gotten COVID. Presumably these are people who didn't necessarily have a positive COVID test, but because certainly the, you know, the benefits from vaccination are lower for people who already had COVID. And so I'm, I'm just wondering about that yeah. sample selection issue. Yeah, I don't think we knew their COVID, um, the results of their COVID tests. I mean, Rido probably knows that, but that wasn't given to us that I that I recall. Although uh, you know, my my co panelists can can jump in on this one if that's the case. If I'm wrong about that, um, they are a funny group of people. Um, so you know, there are some people who would have early on we we ran RCTs to try to get people to be tested. You know, that was the behavior we wanted. So um, uh, they were willing to be tested, uh, but yet not vaccinated, some proportion of them very well may, may be, may have had COVID and didn't feel the need to be tested uh, to, to get the vaccine or certainly to rush to get the vaccine. Uh, but we don't really know, um, we don't really know. There's a lot of, this was an interesting uh, you know, uh, project because there are a lot of mysteries in regards to the data. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, Ronnie's got a question about adaptive experimentation. Yeah, somebody unmuted me, so let me ask you. Um, am I, you know, when I looked at your slide on the tiny differences, you mentioned that family concern, the, the number was high, I'm looking at 47,000. Um, is, it, is it possible that this wasn't properly executed? I mean, did your adaptive randomization hurt? You ended up assigning one quarter of the users to something that was below average, actually. Yeah, well, actually, so so we had a very noisy experiment. Um, let me let me show you. Um, this is the this is this is the proportions of people being vaccinated. So this is not difference in proportions. These are just proportions uh, day by day. Um, and what you can see is family concern. You guys can see this, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, great. Yeah. So notice that like what's happening. I mean, I think it was a bad bet. If that's part of the question, I think it was a bad bet. Well, it's not a bad bet. Is it possible that it's a bug? Because you're actually raising my concern that on the first few days, family concern did do worse than average. Why yeah. did it get in iteration two more traffic? It's a very good question. Um, uh, you know, I don't, I imagine, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure that it was well executed. Um, Kevin Wilson, can I ask you to, to to chime in on this at all? If there's any any uh, any uh, perspective that just, you, you know, have being to in industry, I'm always suspicious of you know bugs and stuff because I've seen them happen over and over. Yeah, again. Ronnie's a big believer in Twyman's law. Any interesting yes. figure is probably wrong. Yeah, well, <laughs> very possible. I mean, but uh, but yeah. Kevin Kevin and I stepped through the code. Uh, together yeah. so it felt but it, like it's just it was interesting good. because yeah looking at this this sort of even suggests that early on in particular family concern is not doing so well right right yeah i mean i'm happy to say like i i am uh it is very possible that there is a bug right like that's a as Feynman's law i it's agree, always true that, like it, it's always <laughs> true um i i mean uh if you we, we i also like in some early uh, steps through. I was. Uh, we did check, and like some things were uh, family concern may have actually been, um, you know, potentially good in some ways. But uh, one thing is that if you want, uh, there, the code is actually public. So if you uh, if you go to our GitHub, which is attached to, the yeah, paper, we're not going to resolve it here. Uh, I'm just saying that this yeah, data is, raises the probability that there's something wrong because family concern the first few days is worse than average. Yeah. 
I, uh, so I don't disagree. Yeah, I, I do. Yeah, I don't disagree. Yeah. That there was some yeah. also some interesting. I do remember that there were some. There was a whole. Uh, the way in which data came to us and we learned about who had been mm -hmm. vaccinated was not straightforward. And that it involved a lot of learning about duplicate observations and, and, and other kinds, of, and other kinds yes. of data problems. And an important point about this is that we were initially, uh, we, were, we were very, um, what's the word, optimistic. Uh, so Rido actually sent us data week over week about new people who had been tested uh, but also had removed people who had, for instance, signed up for vaccinations, whether or not they had actually ultimately gotten a vaccination. But our ultimate outcome was actually different than the thing that we were um, choosing the arms based upon, that we were reweighting the arms based upon, based upon the availability of data, because people sign up for vaccinations actually quite quickly, um, potentially, or we hope they do but they don't necessarily get vaccinated for you know, a week or two later. Do they actually go to their appointment? Um, and those kinds of things actually are potential downstream uh, effects. So even something, so that the chart that, that Jake just showed is actually the chart that looks at it from the ultimate result, not necessarily from the perspective of the first Tuesday of the yeah. experiment. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so it could be a data issue. It could be, um, there was some back and forth. There was actually, um, I will also say in the second week, there was a bit of a quick bug from Rido's side setting us the data. There was a bit of a change in the way they were processing the data um, that got resolved as time went on. So it is possible that all those things are kind of influencing the ultimate outcome. And to it, it is a, a big caution for working with uh, partners, especially when there's kind of an opaque black box. Uh, when you can't personally control every bit of the experiment yourself. <laughs> Um, you have to rely on somebody on the other side. And then sometimes, you know, if, if Feynman's law is true on their end and you can't observe it, then uh, that might also be uh, a thing to keep in mind. So yeah, there are many potential explanations. I, I, I don't think that yeah. the specifics of the top one sampling and the reweighting is incorrect, but as I say, we can take a look again, but um, I, I think but it's I something think that's, else. That's a really theory. interesting point to me is the idea that actually when you're thinking about trying to implement some sort of adaptive experimental design, uh, that often the way you might try to simulate that using past data that you have from another experiment is to say, oh yeah, so here are the people who got vaccinated on this day and this day and this day. And that's the data that we would have on that day or with you know, a two day delay. But then it turns out that the data is coming in in a more haphazard way. And maybe that that's you know, very important to incorporate somehow into the adaptive experimentation but it's very hard to reason about that. So I, actually, I feel like that could be one of the um, <clears throat> one of the interesting contributions here would be to actually share what the numbers did look like along the way and how those didn't even match the final numbers that you would have at that time, because that really provides a sort of limitation on how much you can really do adaptive um, experimentation effectively. So that's that's very interesting. So I think actually related to this, just kind of um, one of the questions is prompted both by, by that, the adaptive experimentation, but also some of what you were showing, Heng Chen, of the um, you know, shorter run and longer run um, uh, effects. And I, I love that the, the cumulative uh, plot over time in, in your paper where you, you show that you know, these effects do actually last some uh, while. So I'm just thinking, how can we iterate on interventions without waiting too long in some cases. So even, even if we are seeing something very promising and um, should we be using more parametric modeling there? Like in my, in my world where I interact a lot with people doing marketing, people think about models like CLV, customer lifetime value, where you have some parametric model of where, when customers are gonna stick around. And so I wonder um, um, maybe Heng Chen first, what, what you think about, you know, what could you have concluded after only the first week of the study. Yeah, I think now I'm going to talk about this from a God perspective after I already seen the results. So definitely there will be some <laughs> high side bias. But I think one thing that actually turns out to be helpful for our thought process is understand to what understand that what might drive the difference or the similarity between a proximal or remote deviate. Let me elaborate. So our proximal deviate is about whether people make appointment within one week, right? 
But how do we know in advance that actually most people who make the appointment do show up for the actual appointment, we would know basically the appointment would reflect the vaccination behavior very well. And we know that after the fact in this setting, because UCLA Health actually did a really good job at reminding people that they already signed up for the appointment. And also in this specific uh, case, the COVID vaccine, my intuition is people who decided to sign up really believe in the value, so they are more likely to show up uh, later. But I could imagine there are other cases where either the hospital did not good job, did not do a good job at reminding people they have appointment, or it's something that people don't, the, the gap from actually make appointment to actually show up can be larger, then I would not necessarily be that confident that, oh, I observe a huge e effect on appointment, it will translate into vaccination later. So one lesson for me in this process is, in this setting have some sense about how likely the initial quick behavior indeed is likely to translate into a long-term DV based on either you know whether there are additional interventions or tools that the company is doing to get people um, to actually show up for the appointment or you know to what extent the people have people who do the initial behavior already are likely to, to show up. I think that's, that's helpful for you to predict uh, whether the effect will show up in the long-term. Right. I mean, a way at least marketers would talk about this is that this funnel, this idea that you're exactly. getting people partway down the funnel and then wait, what is the conversion rate from there? Both what is the average conversion, conversion rate already? And then what's going to be that, that conditional conversion rate that stepped down the funnel for these incremental people? Is it better or worse? And we can maybe start to have some intuitions about that. I know uh, Garrett Johnson and for others, for, for example, have presented here at, at Code before this massive meta-analysis of advertising experience where they show you know, website visitors then to converters. Well, the incremental people are like, I think only in, in that meta-analysis are more like 60% as good in, in terms of conditional conversion rate mm -hmm. as the marginal people. Um, but even, even the, the sort of the sense of the average people might be, might be useful. Helpful. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I, very interesting. And I might just to just add one quick, quick thing here. I mean, one thing about these ad adaptive experiments is that they can be quite noisy depending on your kind of your sample. And actually, I wonder about training some parametric models to smooth that noise, like predict for each person, you know, like if, if you're having a, a flow uh, where maybe appointments are not a perfect, you have an intermediate outcome of some kind that is pretty noisy because you haven't cleaned it because it's coming in fast. I wonder about smoothing those uh, just to sort of reduce the variability uh, instead of adapting on the, on, what you, on the raw flow of the data. I think that's a really cool idea. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, so one, one thing I wanted to, to um, ask uh, Heng Chang about, and actually if anyone in the audience has questions, please you know, post things in the chat, Q and A, raise your hand, um, we can, we can uh, let you ask your question. But I, what I wanted to ask about was this, this question of kind of what I might think of as non-compliance or selective exposure, that um, if somebody sends me a link to watch a video, maybe I don't click on it. Whereas if I'm in a study, I do watch the, the video. And so what are maybe your lessons learned about other ways that we could try to better simulate uh, that in a lab experiment or in a pilot of some kind? to get a sense that, hey, maybe this non-compliance is a problem. And, and to what extent do you, do you think actually that was part of what drove this year? I mean, I think there was pretty low video watch rates in mm -hmm. your video-based messages, right? Yeah, there are a couple of things going on and Silva, feel free to, my co-author, Silva, feel free to join anytime into this conversation. I think, yes, first, uh, the video watching rate is relatively low, uh, 20%. Um, so there is definitely selection in terms of who would choose to watch a video in our RCTs. Um, and in terms of the difference between what we observe online versus what we observe in the field, there are many differences between those two settings. So my point is not really say I can pin down one reason, but I want to draw a cautionary tale because often what researchers do, and we do see some of the ongoing research that are using video intervention or other type of similar educational tools, they force people to be exposed to the message. Even the same thing with text reminder, you could argue in the field, people may not even be exposed to text reminder, but in the lab, they are forced to really pay attention to our manipulation. Uh, so that could be, in general, the elicitation 
procedure and then the exposure to intervention already differ from lab in the field. But going back to your question about what can we do in the lab to make the learn to make it more predictive behavior in the field. For example, now if I can run a study again, maybe what I could do is to also get some sense of when people have to voluntarily decide whether or not they're going to click the link in the message in an online setting. I can see how that um, like factor in the initial selection and the people's opt-in tendency, and then see whether the video would still, uh, the offering of the video would make a difference. And that may not still, that may still not get us there because we would imagine on MTurk people with the demand effect, they will just click the link. They don't want to be deducted bonus, but it may get us a step closer to a little bit closer to predict the real behavior whether people also opt in compared with the case where we force people. But, but again, I think given how common it is for experimenters to actually force people to be exposed to an intervention in the lab and use that to inform policy, I still think there are some cautionary tales we want to draw based on the observations we observe in our case. Yeah, but definitely we can make it better. By yeah, I think it's, it's a really nice example. Sometimes we think, oh, um, you know, one of the great things about an experiment with full compliance is you can estimate the average treatment effect. But then it turns out no one cares about the average treatment effect if you're never going to be able to actually get those people to get treated. What you really are actually going to be working with is, is a late, uh, you know, an effect just for those compliers, or really often you don't even observe compliance very well. And so it's kind of just some intent to treat effect. So mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah. I think that's that's one of the things I appreciate about just this this whole line of work that you that both of your teams are engaged in is showing some of the the, the pitfalls along the way here too because I think in, in a lot of ways you you all followed such you know clear best practices around hey let's try to screen a bunch of ideas and see that this is promising and uh, and and then maybe that was that was a little misleading yeah um what one thing I wanted to ask you about is just uh, to put you on the spot a little bit, Peng Chen, and say, what what might you theorize about, uh, uh, you know, this this Rhode Island intervention and maybe why why they had less success? So, I mean, Jake offered some explanations, but I I, I wonder what you think. <laughs> Great. Okay, um, yes. And uh, Jake may already know what I think since we also had a little bit uh, exchange more formally. In, 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 um, but anyway, the we actually very, very much agree in general. We agree with their, um, the, the intuition. And I think that's also something consistent with an effect. So the idea is, um, the idea is the main did the baseline vaccination, uh, baseline vaccination intention matter. So in their case, uh, the holdout rates, the, the, the vaccination rate in a holdout group is relatively low. It's about 2%. But in our case, the overall vaccination rates in the holdout group is about 30%. So it's 30%, not like 70%, but still it's much higher than 2%, which suggests that people in our population, we, we, are, we are working with a group of people who are relatively less hesitant compared with the population in Jake's sample. And one difference could be because they ran an experiment in May and, uh, and the June where people have long become eligible. And in our case, we're working with people at the most, it's the middle of April when um, the availability has just begun to be opened up to everyone in the US. So the sample differences would, the timing differences may lead to the differences in the baseline motivation to get vaccinated, which based on our theoretical prediction, could lead to uh, differences in the response to text reminder, given the reminders are really designed to close the intention action gap. And as Jake alluded to in his talk in the beautiful summary slides, like messages, reminders are not designed to, to address your concern about safety or effectiveness or really address any political uh, attitudes you may have towards the vaccine. So it is more, it's work better among people who are not against it. And in fact, um, and yeah, so I think uh, I think with our three sets of analysis uh, that I presented earlier today, it provides some evidence for the speculation, which seems to be consistent with with Jake's team's um, one reason they offer as well. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah. like we're we're sort of converging on on a on an ability to go to a, a state agency or a health or you know a health company and say you should be sending SMS messages 
now to these kind of people, but save your money and s- later. I mean, we, we're I think we're converging into some sense of of how to choose when to use which lever. I mean, again, we're early, super early days. We're less than a year from from this, but I don't know. I kind of feel like that's been going on in a nice way here. Yeah, yeah. I think this is. Yeah, I mean, I, I I'm kind of just proud of of like applied social sciences and 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 statistical and experimental design work uh, in in a lot of this effort. So I think that's great. Um, and and I think also uh, you know these replies answered one of the questions that had come up in in the chat as well is just this idea that I think you know uh, when the UCLA experiment was taking place, um, the vaccine had just become widely available. There may have been some sort of feelings of scarcity, whereas uh, in the Rhode Island experiment that was um, a little bit, uh, you know, this is much later. So anybody could readily get a vaccine if they wanted to. Um, and so that's, you know, maybe one way of also thinking about the effectiveness of this ownership intervention, the psychological ownership intervention. It feels maybe to me more exciting if I own something that is somewhat scarce uh, than if I own something that uh, everyone's trying to give away, so. Exactly. And in fact, I'll give a shout out to a PhD student at Anderson who currently works with Crack Fox to understand a similar intervention, the underlying mechanism. They call it a reserve for you. Uh, so the idea is if I tell you the vaccine is a reserve for you, it really creates a sense of exclusivity. And then that's consistent with your intuition. Like exclusivity should only work when indeed it feels more ex- exclusive. So that could be um, consistent to, with your speculation. Yeah, very interesting. One of the other things that, that popped up for me here was just thinking about, you know, in, uh, in, in the Rhode Island case, uh, you had this, this universe of all the people who had been tested and not yet been vaccinated. And yet you ended up with statistical power problems. Uh, and we could think of that as that these just effects were really small or, you know, um, if, if there were effects here, these are the type of effects that you just could not discover at the scale of Rhode Island, basically. And okay, Rhode Island is not the biggest uh, <laughs> jurisdiction, but it's not it's not tiny either, right? And so this just made me think about you know at at some point where should we you know even if there are some effects there that we as as behavioral scientists and um, people designing experiments we have to focus our attention on things that are kind of possible to study using these methods, right? Um, and so the question of whether this was there was no effect at all. Uh, or whether it's just, hey, we should allocate our attention elsewhere. And, and Jake, I think you put this in terms of, hey, what's the kind of, you know, the ROI on this? Where could we spend this cost? And I wonder how either one of you thinks about um, this. Is this sort of a, you know, cost per person vaccinated? If a lot of what's happening is we're shifting people to get vaccinated earlier, perhaps much earlier than they would have otherwise, uh, should we think of this in some sort of a model of, uh, how much, how many cases or hospitalizations we're preventing? Um, what is the kind of cost benefit analysis here? And you know, how how large are the costs? Should we really be concerned about the actual nominal cost of the text message, or is it about annoying people or or something like that? Um, so how how do you think about the cost benefit analysis here? If we were to compute an, an ROI or something like that. Jake, you're yeah, I can, a lot. So. Yeah, I can jump in on it because, in fact, so our our our, our, pro, our so that the, the the cost of annoyance is why we stopped a day early because Rida was worried that people would block emergency messages from them in the future, it, and they said we can't have if we need to if the government if the health department has to send an emergency med- message to the public, we cannot have them stopping it when we say evacuate your city or whatever it is. So that's why, that's why, I mean, I'm not laughing at them. It's just something, I, it's a cost of annoyance that I hadn't ever imagined, but it was very vivid to them. I think that the idea of, uh, I have, you know, the components of the cost function have to do with, you know, how, uh, how, how many, you know, how many people vaccinated more quickly increase the, the, the herd-ish, herd style, click style immunity uh, that therefore protects the unvaccinated around them. I think. I think speed is, should not be discounted either. Um, let alone, like you know, uh, in the UCLA study, when they're the, me- the median age or mean age was seventy years old, like you're really 
saving many costs there. Our, our age, mean age was 40. So it was less costly to these, uh, with, with these people. But those are some elements to this that I think, in a way, you should kind of list those down. Say how, how important if, is it, if, if, you're, if you're not a governmental group, maybe, being, maybe have people block your, your, your numbers okay. Uh, but that's a high cost to that group. Anyway, Henshin, did you have a? Yeah, uh, I agree with what you what you were saying in terms of the elements of the cost benefit analysis. A couple of thoughts. One is, I do think in this specific context, acceleration matters a lot. Uh, you, even though there are a lot of cases where oh, we're simply just moving people doing it faster. In this case, acceleration is important. And in our work, we do see there are evidence of acceleration plus increase. And then the second thing is, um, I think when we think about the cost, we can also think about opportunity cost. What else can we do with this with this small amount of relatively small amount of money we are allocating to do text message? Yeah, we could develop a financial incentive, but even financial incentive may or may not be effective based on what we see in recent working paper. It also depends on the population. So even when you implement the more forceful alternative approaches, you also have to be aware it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, and then thinking about a text message, um, yes, it might annoy people, uh, but on the other hand, like in, in Katie uh, Milkman's uh, Mac study, I think they have some evidence suggesting having more reminders, two reminders, or at least two reminders better than one. So even though the effect size is not huge, there are additional benefits of sending more. Obviously sending 10 would be annoying. So there are things we can learn in terms of the boundary, how to balance the, the benefits and the annoyance as, as, a, as a cost. And finally, I think uh, Devin Pope in their science paper about financial incentives, they did try to do a cost benefit analysis for their financial incentive. And there they try to fit in uh, the user existing, someone's existing number about the, the amount of money you can save. You can save if you can save the life of one person from getting the, the COVID. Um, so if anyone is interested, I'm just recommending them to check out that citation and learn more about additional elements that should be incorporated into the calculation. Cool. Thanks a lot. This is a great discussion and we could certainly continue it, but we're actually over time and it's time uh, for a break.